is paper woven into cloth bags? What does pressure do for canned products? Why is packaging so important to the economy? Industry on Parade, Peabody Award winner for public service, produced on film each week by the National Association of Manufacturers. These are matches being produced by the billions every year. And these are clothespins. Despite the advent of automatic dryers, clothespins too are still turned out in great volume. Many things are produced in equally impressive quantities. So much so that the question arises, how do all these products of our farms and factories, these great mountains of goods, find their way in such orderly fashion to their ultimate consumers? The answer is the story of distribution. And an important part of distribution is packaging. This is a report on how packaging improves life in America. Our report begins where most packaging begins, in the conference rooms of industry, where designs for the wrapper of a product get almost as much attention as does the design of the product itself. And with good reason, for the wrapper or container serves many purposes. It permits the product to be stored until needed, shipped safely to market, presented to the customer in the most attractive manner, and finally made more convenient to use. And that's just part of the assignment given to packaging experts like these engineers and artists at Millprint Incorporated in Milwaukee. As with most industrial problems, work at the conference table and the drafting table is followed by tests in the laboratory. Here at Minnesota Mining and Manufacturing Company in St. Paul, we see a test of packaging materials in progress. In a tumbler, a 70-pound carton gets a bouncing it wouldn't ordinarily receive, proving the researchers were right when they predicted a new kind of reinforced tape will keep a package securely closed on the roughest kind of journey. After testing of new materials and new designs, packages incorporating them are made by hand, working models, so to speak, on which final decisions will be based. And then they go into production. Packages that are the result of long and careful planning, yet are capable of being produced rapidly in quantity and of being used very simply. Here at Old Dominion Box Company in Charlotte, North Carolina, it takes only a matter of minutes to transform a plain roll of box board into a fabulous array of containers. After it goes through the color press, the material is fed into a slitting machine. It's like another printing press, except that instead of type, this one has sharp dies. The separated strips, each of which will become a carton, are fed now into a machine that folds and glues them automatically at the rate of 12,000 an hour. They emerge flat, ready for shipment. But when they're opened, there you are, ready to be filled. Package makers use great quantities of raw materials, paper, metal, cellophane, and plastics of various kinds, to name a few. But so efficiently do the designers and factory technicians do their work that rarely does a package account for more than a penny or two of a product's cost. And many actually lead to savings all around, like the six packs we'll see being manufactured at the Atlanta Paper Company. By creating an appealing package that holds six bottles or cans of a beverage, industry was able to hold down handling costs and to realize more of the economies that result from production of larger and larger quantities made possible by increased demand. The whirling blades inside this machine slit off excess paper and crease the cartons along edges to be folded. And the unassembled cartons flow out at the astonishing rate of 450 per minute, ready for the next machine which both folds them and glues them automatically.
Efficient methods used in the manufacture of the package itself also help hold down the cost of the products we buy. Another inspired packaging idea is based on rolls of paper a quarter of an inch wide. At the Bemis Bag Company plant in St. Louis, machines first twist the ribbons to give them added strength and then treat the paper yarn, much like fiber yarn, as looms weave it into a product called Visionet, an inexpensive netting through which you can see and thus inspect the oranges, onions, or potatoes that are packaged in bags made from the material. In addition to making the contents visible, the woven paper also has the advantage of providing ventilation for vegetables and fruits. The bags are sewn in an endless chain that will be snipped apart later for printing with the name of the company that will put them to use. At a Philadelphia can factory, this machinery is turning out one of the newest things in metal packaging. The propulsion can is used these days for everything from fire extinguishers to insecticides and squirt forth their contents easily with the help of low and medium pressure gases inside. Interiors are sprayed with one of a number of coatings depending on what the cans will contain. Later, exteriors also will be coated and lithographed. The bottoms are attached with the only seam used in the package, which is tested to withstand pressure of 20 pounds to the square inch, generated by the inert gas that will be inserted with the contents. Pressure is used in another way in the packaging of great quantities of coffee, as we're about to see here at this New Jersey plant. In goes the coffee, carefully measured out and weighed by machines that are representative of the many complex devices in which industry invests large sums so that its products can be moved swiftly and efficiently from plant to distributor to retailer to consumer. Once coffee has been ground, it begins to lose flavor fast. And that brings us to the methods that have been worked out to solve the problem. Vacuum packing on the one hand, pressure packing on the other. Both techniques designed to keep the product fresh. In this case, pressure is used, nitrogen being pumped into each can and sealed there. 24 hours later, the pressure inside the cans is tested like this. Those with too little pressure are automatically rejected. The others, after passing final inspection, move on for packing and shipment to all parts of the world. Like coffee, tobacco is extremely sensitive to climatic conditions, but with the help of modern packaging materials and machines that operate at fantastic speed, cigarettes are so well protected during storage and shipment that they reach customers everywhere in perfect condition. Many industries contribute to the packaging story. Among them, they supply experts like the chemists who discovered and developed transparent, moisture-resistant cellophane, the metallurgists responsible for versatile foils, and of course, from our industries has come the investment in research that uncovered these and many other new materials. New plastics are among the fruits of
quicker, more items are added to the boxes. For pizza, tomato sauce. For other food products, In schools, modern packaging plays a big part in safeguarding the health of the nation's youth. Containers of wax-coated paper and the wide variety of additional materials now in use make available inside the schoolhouse not only milk but all the other essentials of a well-balanced diet at peak freshness and low cost. For each package, there are many uses. Collapsible tubes that dispense toothpaste can also dispense lubricating oil, as can plastic squeeze bottles, which are just as handy for machine oil as they are for hair oil. Window washing's easier thanks to packaging. So is cooking, just a few of the everyday household activities simplified by useful plastic packages. On the list of containers used for suntan lotion, is the propulsion can we saw being manufactured earlier. Cans that also hold and spray out just the right amount of hair preparation. Or shaving cream. And just about anything else you can think of in the field of good grooming. A can of enamel is a sprayer too. And it can whip up and neatly serve a batch of cream topping for shortcake. One more item improved and made more widely available than ever before by industry's concern for the package. The package that brings so many good things into our lives. American industry, builder of a better tomorrow, has presented Industry on Parade, a service of the National Association of Manufacturers. What business is this little fellow a partner? Which new industry was founded on crystals of germanium? What human motivation keeps the nation going? Industry on Parade, Peabody Award winner for public service, produced on film each week by the National Association of Manufacturers. Here's a familiar American scene, a couple of kids opening a lemonade stand. Bob takes care of the advertising while production remains their Jane. What inspires such enterprise? The same incentive that sparks the whole American economy, the hope of making money. In a word, profit. Flattering as the junior partner's interest may be, it's customers the business needs. And that's where dad comes in, bringing some advice along with his trade. He can give his children useful pointers because basically this new enterprise of theirs is much the same as his service station business or the largest manufacturing company in the nation. Success starts with a good product, and Dad knows a good product when he tastes one. But a good product is just the beginning. Bob and Jane are fortunate. Their business is off to a flying start. And they're already dreaming of things to buy with the rewards of success. But if this was a permanent business, 
They would want to grow, and that would mean putting a lot of the profits back into the business instead of spending it. That's what happens in real life. Much of the profits, and often all of them, being plowed right back into companies year after year. Take Dad's filling station, for example. A good part of the profits must be reinvested in newer and better equipment to meet rugged competition. Bob and Jane's father risked his savings in this business for the same reason he went to work earlier for other people. For the same reason the kids themselves sell lemonade. To profit so he can improve himself. Most of what he takes in goes to others. To the suppliers of his gasoline, to the bank as interest on loans that help set up the business, to pay his employees, and to the government. What finally is left is the profit. On the average, somewhere around five cents on each dollar of sales. But most of that must be retained business. So generally, it's less than half of the 5% that our businessman receives as the reward for his efforts and investment. This is the reward with which he supports himself and his family and tries to build some savings for the children's education. And here's where profits come in again. Dad tells the children this. He's invested part of the family savings in stocks, in shares of ownership in one of the thousands of firms competing for the use of those savings. How did he make his selection? He based it quite naturally on the money-making possibilities, deciding in this case to risk his filling station profits in part on the profit-making potential of a firm called the General Transistor Corporation, headquartered on New York's Long Island. This enterprise was launched only five years earlier by a small group convinced it could prosper in electronics. Now, President Herman Fialkoff on the left recalls how they lost money the first and second years they were in business. The product, transistors, which do the work of vacuum tubes in less space and with less power. After two losing years, the founders risked more capital and soon their ability to make high-quality transistors at low cost brought a major sale to Remington Rand Univac. This was the sale that started them up the hill, bringing in part of the sizable revenue needed to pay for the costly equipment that transistor manufacturing requires. This machine, one of many, slowly pulls or draws crystals of germanium, the heart of the transistor. Because the tiniest impurity or irregularity could ruin the whole operation, skilled workers must be on the watch every moment, constantly making adjustments. And so it goes. With additional skilled workers, additional costly machines being required at each stage of the manufacturing process. As, for example, on the machine that slices the large crystals into thin wafers with extremely fine tolerances. Much of the equipment is experimental, this lapping or grinding machine, for example, which the company hopes will lead to improved quality, improving the performance of each individual transistor. Through painstaking, costly trial and error, the young industrialists worked out many of their own tools and techniques. In this department, every worker had to be equipped with a powerful microscope. So fine is the work in progress. Next, the transistor heart will be placed in an alloying furnace, where several elements will be fused together. Transistors are really not complicated, but the precision, the accuracy required in making them can lead to a rejection rate as high as 90%. It was General Transistor's ability to bring that rejection rate way down that contributed to its quick success. And as a result of that success, new jobs opened up. Workers apply here because the company is successful profitable. Profits for the company mean job security for the employees. And that's one reason why industry is concerned over figures showing today's profit on each dollar of sales to be lower than in the 1920s, although average hourly factory pay has steadily increased. Should this firm's profits dry up, so would the thousands of jobs it has created.
Seeing all the activity, you'd think management could sit back and take it easy for a long time. But the fact is, there seems to be more to be done every day for here and throughout industry, steadily rising costs of labor and equipment squeeze the profit margin of safety ever thinner. A 5% cost increase in a single recent year would have cut industrial profits by 50%. Yet profits are the primary lure for the investors on whom industry depends for the capital it needs to keep up with wear and tear, the growing demands of a growing population. Here at General Transistor, the dramatic development of an idea into a major enterprise was made possible by the issuance and sale of stock to thousands of share owners who were willing to forego dividends so that every cent of profit could be reinvested. Under present tax laws and increasing costs, the fact is that industry has to spend large parts of its profits just to keep from slipping back. Thus, the average dividend industry is able to pay its owners amounts to only about one-fourth of profits, with three-fourths expended in keeping up to date and moving ahead. So, there's little room for error in industry, and yet the danger of error is great. Not until transistors are tested and sorted, for example, can it be known just how good they are, what jobs they'll do, and what price they'll bring. That's why there's so much attention to testing of all kinds, to quality control in general. For costs go up with the rejection rate, and as we said, it's largely by keeping rejections low that the firm has been able to succeed where others have failed. These transistors are being fed into the machine that will mark them according to their capabilities, which must be extremely high for the computer market in which the company's production is concentrated. It's a market, incidentally, that's growing fast. To maintain and expand its share of that computer market, the transistor company had to keep growing too, building a second plant not long after production began in the first. Then another was added in Rhode Island, and later still more, including a subsidiary to supply the Pacific Coast. It couldn't have been done without profits, reinvested in growth. But soon the company's books began to show the existence of a high hurdle in the path of expansion. Nowadays, when the treasurer visits the accounting office, he finds more and more of the money needed for new plants is going to Washington instead. In the first profitable year, taxes took nearly $200,000. The next year, almost $350,000. By the third year, the tax bill had climbed to more than half a million dollars, an amount that leaves less than half the net income available to pay for the growth the firm must achieve in order to stay healthy. Essential to this growth is a large-scale research program, a program that costs nearly $250,000 in a single year. Top talent has to be employed in this work, and again, expensive equipment. It's all an indispensable part of the march of progress. The Latin word for progress, by the way, is the root from which our own word profit is derived. Profits have inspired the search for better products and better ways to make them through the centuries. Profits are the goal behind invention and behind our way of life. Nearly every paycheck in America has a stake in new inventions fresh from the laboratories of industrial researchers. The transistor itself was discovered at the Bell Telephone Laboratories as recently as 1948. Today, that discovery is responsible for the employment of thousands, including those here at General Transistor, where more researchers now work on even newer ideas. And always they look for the most economical way to produce, because that's the way to earn profits for employer, employee, and the public alike. The best deal in life, and an even better life for our children in years to come. Since we first met them, the young executives of this company have come far. But they still have their eye on the future as they discuss a plan for a major basic research center at nearby Adelphi College. 
they decide to back the program because it looks profitable for industry and for the community. They feel a good active academic research center nearby can't help but improve the area's electronics industry. And so again, at least in part, they're guided by the motive that inspired them to risk their savings and their energies on an infant enterprise. It's the same motive that inspired the filling station operator to go into business for himself, and that inspired his children to open their lemonade stand. The quest for profits with which we can get the things we need and want. For Jane, the lemonade profits mean a new doll. For Bob, profits also mean a toy. Yes, profits mean many things. Automobiles, houses, highways, schools. Profits have brought lower prices and job security. Profits are the spark plug of the enterprise that makes America the best place to live in the world. American industry, builder of a better tomorrow, has presented Industry on Parade, a service of the National Association of Manufacturers. Why is a coal mine a good place to farm? Where are windows made of paper? What buildings get columns after the walls are up? How did playfulness land these fish in the net? Industry on Parade, a brand new look at our America, produced each week by the National Association of Manufacturers. Mining in Kansas, modern style. It's called surface mining, and in many places where a bituminous coal is found, especially in the Midwest, this is the only way of getting it out. The latest types of equipment are used to clear away layers of earth and expose a coal vein that's too close to the surface for the traditional mining methods. When rock, shale, and similar strata are encountered, they blast. Giant shovels with scoops as big as city buses scoop up the overburden and pile it into pits already mined. When the coal is bared, a mechanical coal buster called a pinning machine goes to work, breaking it loose. The hammer goes up, then down it comes with a bang to set the stage for the loading shovel that dumps into a truck five tons at a time, coal that has lain undisturbed for millions of years. Now it's put into the service of man by strip miners who are engineers and mechanics with machines to do the heavy work. At this stage, the mine run coal is only a raw material which must now be refined. By truck and train, it goes to the tipple which is to coal what a refinery is to oil. In this case, it's a tipple of the Pittsburgh and Midway Coal Mining Company. Best way to empty a car, they found, is simply to turn the car over and pour the coal out, as you'd pour sugar out of a cup. Inside, the coal gets a preliminary grating on screens that separate larger lumps from the fines. Next, into unique washing jigs, where pure coal is floated free of the heavier, inferior coal, slate, and other refuse. Then comes another grating according to size. There are 22 different sizes in all, ranging from powder to seven inch lumps. A size and a type for each of coal's hundreds of different uses. But what about the land from which the coal came? Is this the way it's left for future generations? Not by a long shot. Throughout the industry, scientific reclamation of mined areas is standard practice. Timber is planted. 
pastures are sown and livestock farms developed. So instead of this, we have this. In many cases, the land is actually improved over what it was before mining began. Cattle graze on land once considered submarginal. Chains of lakes form where none were before. Surface mining has actually brought utilization and development of the land. In 1776, a group of patriots signed the Declaration of Independence in Philadelphia. This document not only created a free nation, but far more important, it declared freedom for the individual. Its meaning is clear and well-defined, that all men are created equal before the law, that all individuals have the same right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, and that the government must get its power from them. This is the firm foundation upon which American individual freedom is built. Shepherd Envelope Company, Worcester, Massachusetts. Here, a staff of only 120 fine women turn out an amazing two million envelopes a day for correspondence, greeting cards, or payrolls, some with metal flat fasteners, some with windows, some with printing. Envelopes come in many kinds of paper, many different sizes. There are 1,600 variations, all told, so producing envelopes is much more than simply a matter of putting in a roll of paper and turning on a machine. Envelope blanks are die cut, 500 at a time, then any printing to be done is taken care of before the envelope is folded. Next step is cutting the window, if the envelope is to have one. This opening will be covered during the folding operation with a strip of glassine or acetate film. Putting on the strip and folding and gluing the flaps is all done automatically and at a tremendous rate. Despite the increases in paper costs in recent years, our envelope makers, by increasing production, have been able to hold their prices steady. After a trip on the chain conveyor that allows the glue to dry, the envelopes are boxed for shipment. A far cry from the days when people made their own envelopes and sealed them with a blob of melted wax. <laughs> Preparing to pour the walls for a new type of reinforced concrete structure near San Francisco. No, we didn't say floors, we said walls, and that's what they're pouring. It's a fairly old idea that only recently has caught on. You lay your wall forms on the ground, pour the cement around the reinforcing steel mesh, finish it off, and let it set for two or three weeks. When it's properly cured, the wall panel is raised into position by a crane. What's the advantage? Well, by drying in a horizontal position, the walls are stronger and cracks caused by shrinkage are eliminated. In addition, the job is done in about half the time because there's no need for building vertical forms and then tearing them down again when the concrete has cured. Temporary braces will hold the wall panels in place until the supporting columns are poured and set. Openings for doors, windows, plumbing, and other facilities were all provided when the walls were formed. Now, when the columns are poured, they'll become a strong, integral part of the walls because of these protruding steel bars. When the columns are set, the metal forms are removed and the walls are ready for the addition of windows, doors, and roof. Called tilt-up construction, the technique here demonstrated by the San Francisco firm of Barrett and Hilt is speeding essential construction and cutting costs all across the country. In America, large and small business are completely interdependent. One cannot get along without the other. This is a good system. It gets things done. It enables all of us to buy more of the good things in life at the lowest possible price. For instance, there are more than thousand major manufacturers of food and food products. Their success depends upon the 680,000 retail stores which sell their food to the consumer. This same thing holds true for the petroleum industry. 
More than 800 refineries and natural gas plants call upon 400,000 local outlets to place their products in the hands of the public. Industry on parade goes fishing aboard one of the boats of the main sardine fleet. Most sardines are caught in traps called weirs, or in nets strung across the mouths of inlets. But a great many are netted in open water, where their weakness for splashing playfully about on the surface gives them away to a sharp-eyed lookout. The four-man crew wastes no time getting into the small boat. The mother boat stands by and notifies a carrier boat by radio telephone that a catch is in the offing. The men in the small boat rapidly encircle the school of sardines with a net that has weights on one edge and floats on the other. When the ends of the net have been brought together, purse lines are drawn in to close the bottom of the net. A hand winch makes it go a little faster and easier. The carrier boat arrives to take aboard the catch, which would easily swamp the small boat. The net is opened between the two craft, and now tons of sardines will be taken out of it. Some vessels use a king-size vacuum cleaner to pump fish from the net into the hold, but here they rely on the commoner and more picturesque method. Two to five hundred pounds of salt are added for every ton of fish. The name sardine is applied to different fish in different parts of the world. In California and Portugal, it's the pilchard. In Norway, the bristling and the sild. And here in Maine waters, it's the clupia harangus. At the cannery, that super vacuum cleaner we mentioned pumps the fish out, and they're carried into the plant in water-filled sluiceways. From a conveyor, the sardines are deposited in a single layer on wire frames called flakes. On these, they go into a steam chest for cooking. They used to be fried in oil. It's live steam under 100 pounds pressure for from 8 to 20 minutes. After they've cooled and heads have been removed, the sardines are packed as snugly as, well, what's more tightly packed than a can of sardines? On a conveyor belt, the cans will get a measured amount of oil, usually soybean oil, and then pass the sharp eye of another of the many inspectors who check the product at each stage of the operation. And then it's on to be sealed. Tops go on. They're crimped and sealed. On another dizzy ride by conveyor and chute, the cans are cleaned of any oil that may be left on the outside. Next, they pour into a large basket that will fit into a retort where the sardines are given final cooking and cased in their sterilized tins. Finally washed again, they're deposited here for cooling. After one more inspection, they're ready for labeling and shipment to a constantly growing market. 